I think that we can start the recording now. Yes, the recording is started. Welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for another uh, webinar from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. The title is, uh, as you can see, Feeding the Kubernetes Beast, Bringing Data Locality Back to Data Workloads. My name is Alessandro Voz. I'm a principal software engineer at Microsoft and a Cloud Native Ambassador. Um, so I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, so I will collect your q and I will uh, interact with the, with the speaker on your behalf and I hope uh, everybody's going to have a great time. We would like to welcome our presenter today, Adit Madan, uh, is project maintainer at Luxio. And before we get started, of course, just a few housekeeping items. We will collect, there's a QA box uh, in, in Zoom in, at the bottom of your screen. That's where you can, um, you can write your, uh, your questions for after the, the webinar. We will collect them. Uh, so the webinar will last for, uh, the, the presentation will last for 30, 30, 35 minutes. Then we will have time to, to talk about, uh, to, to, to answer your questions. The, this is an official webinar of the Cloud Native Foundation. So please, um, please everybody be aware there's a code of conduct and, um, and we will not let any question that will violate that code of conduct. Now, if a date um, is ready, he may start the webinar, he may start the presentation. Thanks, Alessandro. Uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. Uh, today, like Alessandro mentioned, I'll be talking about feeding the Kubernetes beast uh, with uh, Luxio. Uh, I'm a lead engineer at Luxio. I've been here for about uh, three years now. I hope we all learn something new today. So here's the agenda for today. I'll start with a quick introduction of Aluxio for those who don't know about it. Uh, then I'll move on to describing some fundamental Kubernetes concepts which I'll use in the rest of the presentation. Then I'll talk about different deployment options and use cases for Aluxio on Kubernetes. And I'll end it all with a demo of Spark and Aluxio running in Kubernetes. Okay, so here we go. So if you look at uh, the Luxio project, the project itself began as a research project in 2013 at the AmpLab uh, Amp in UC Berkeley. Now uh, it's been about uh, four years that the company has been established. It's well-funded uh, and it's uh, the goal that we have at Luxio is to orchestrate data at memory speed for the cloud. And what does data orchestration even mean? Like that's something I'll get, in, uh, get into some details in the rest of the talk, so stay tuned for that. We have a fast growing open source community. Uh, we have a variety of contributors from both the industry and academia uh, spread across different parts of the world. Uh, we, our GitHub repository is, uh, is extremely active and in case you want to learn more about the project, uh, feel free to get in touch with us on our community Slack channel. Uh, the link is there on the screen for you guys to view. Okay, so uh, to give you a, some context on why you need a project like Aluxio and in the evolution of the big data ecosystem, uh, let's start with what the first iteration of the big data ecosystem looked like. So when we, we, when we started, uh, we only had one compute framework, which was Hadoop MapReduce, which was co-located with uh, one storage system, which was the Hadoop distributed file system. And uh, your data and compute would reside on the same cluster. You would grow both compute and storage together. The whole premise of running compute on the nodes which have the storage was that you would obtain data locality and data locality is something that is critical for uh, 
for performance and so that you gain timely insights from the data that you have. But if you look at the big data ecosystem today, uh, we have a proliferation of both compute frameworks, including Presto, Spark, MapReduce, Flink, and also a variety of storage systems that are available. Uh, and these storage systems include storage systems both on-premise, such as EMC ECS, uh, Hadoop distributed file system, and also in the cloud, including Amazon S3, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Storage, and so on. Now, each of these compute frameworks uh, serve a specific purpose. They are good at a certain kind of workload, but they still do need to in interface with uh, the variety of storage systems that we have listed at the bottom. Like I mentioned, uh, initially uh, we have, uh, in our journey, we had a co-located compute and storage cluster. Uh, in this picture, I have MapReduce as the compute framework running on HDFS. Typically, what happened uh, in big enterprises and also in, in the cloud was that uh, people observed that most of the clusters were typically compute bound. but in order to add compute capacity, people also had to add storage capacity since storage and compute was co-located. So you can't grow compute and storage independently. Then we moved on to the world with disaggregated compute and storage in which since you have disaggregated storage and compute, you can add based on your needs. So if you need only storage, you would add more nodes to your storage cluster, and if you need only compute, you would add more compute capacity, which is more economical, but uh, what you lose in the process is data locality. And remember, data locality was the whole premise of why MapReduce and Hadoop, the data ecosystem, started with co-locating uh, compute and storage. Also, uh, what happened was that when people have big clusters of HDFS on premise, uh, they, when they want to grow out the compute, they could either grow out the compute by adding more nodes to their on premise clusters, or they could choose compute in the cloud. So you could say that, no, I, wa I want additional compute capacity, and I I'll want to use that in Google's cloud, Amazon's cloud, or Microsoft's cloud. And also, like we mentioned before, since uh, with the proliferation of the compute frameworks, people now want to use many more compute frameworks uh, in, a, in addition to just Hive or MapReduce, which are more suitable to their workloads. The other thing which happened with the move to the cloud was that now uh, we have cheap object storage solutions which are available and the cost of data storage is much cheaper than it is to buy a node, uh, to provision a physical node and store your data in HDFS. So all of the, this entire stack uh, is also uh, highly uh, useful uh, how it's deployed on top of Kubernetes in, in many uh, deployments. Okay, so uh, this is where exactly where Luxio comes in uh, with different compute frameworks talking to different storage systems. Uh, Luxio acts as a virtual abstraction layer which sits in between the compute frameworks and the storage systems. Luxio exposes different APIs, uh, including the Java native file system API, uh, and a Hadoop compatible API, which is which we have labeled as the HDFS interface in this picture, and other interfaces such as the POSIX interface, which allows applications to access storage systems, including object stores, with the same familiar interface that they are used to. So end applications do not need to make any code changes, but they could still work with any of the storage systems that we have labeled below. <laughs> 
So some of the key innovations of Aluxio uh, include uh, the three bullets, the three pillars that I have on the screen. Uh, the first one is uh, data locality. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, as we are increasingly moving from a world with where there was co-located compute and storage into a world where we have disag disaggregated compute and storage, data locality is something that uh, is not easily preserved in a situation like that. So the layer, by having a layer of Aluxio in the middle, we, I'll, and I'll talk about the solution in the following slides, we are able to have data locality without making additional copies or migrating data to the remote, uh, to a, a compute cluster, which may not be the same as your, uh, uh, as your storage cluster. The second pillar that I have over there is uh, labeled data accessibility. So you could still continue to use the popular APIs which your frameworks are familiar with to access your storage, which uh, could be located anywhere. It could be uh, in the cloud. It could be in a, in a cloud which is uh, in a different region, uh, spread, across, uh, spread across geographically. And um, the third, the third bullet I have over there is data elasticity. Uh, what this means uh, is that within the single file system namespace that Aluxio provides, you could have access to data spread across storage systems. So imagine you have um, a hive table uh, which could be stored across different storage systems. So you could have some partitions uh, stored in HDFS, some partitions in S3, or some partitions in yet another storage system. Here are some examples of how an end application interacts with Aluxio. Uh, if you look at, uh, if you're familiar with Spark, uh, you can see that uh, accessing data through Aluxio is very similar to how you'd access data from HDFS. The only difference is that you, instead of the HDFS scheme, you have the Aluxio scheme and pointing to the Aluxio master. And so what you have is that with only configuration changes and no code changes for your end application, you could switch from moving HDFS to using Aluxio, which enables you to access data across storage systems and also access data on object stores. Similarly, uh, for Presto, uh, if you're familiar with Presto, it looks exactly the same. The only change is that you would move from the HDFS uh, scheme to the Luxio scheme. The third bullet that I have over there is uh, the POSIX API. So you could interact with Aluxio using a, a familiar POSIX API by simply issuing uh, calls as you would issue calls to a local file system. And uh, this is an interface that we've seen increasingly popular for machine learning applications such as TensorFlow running on Kubernetes. And the most uh, flexible way of interacting with Aluxio, which gives you the most amount of control, is using our native Java API, which is our Java client library. Uh, and this, uh, in case you want to uh, roll out some applications, fresh applications running directly on Aluxio, you could choose to use that. Okay, so uh, since I'll be talking about uh, the deployment of Aluxio on Kubernetes, I just want to give you a high-level architecture of what Aluxio looks like. So Aluxio is a distributed file system uh, which has uh, master and worker components. The master component for Aluxio is something which stores the metadata for the distributed file system. And the workers uh, is the component which stores the, the actual data cached by Aluxio. So uh, in this picture that I have, uh, I have two applications, uh, Presto and Spark, accessing a single Aluxio cluster. All uh, and uh, the end data that's being accessed uh, could be uh, is residing in uh, the two pillars I have on the right, which is the object store 
and uh, also HDFS. So you could think of uh, if we are talking about uh, a cloud deployment in which Alexio and the compute application is deployed in a cloud, uh, we could have a situation in which HDFS resides on-premise. You are accessing data in the cloud from your on-premise HDFS cluster, and at the same time, you have some additional data which you want to store in the object store which is provided by that cloud. So uh, what would happen is when you access data from Luxio, uh, you would cache the data in Luxio based on uh, whatever the location is. So if you want to access HDFS data, uh, you could set policies in which, uh, which control how Luxio stores the data that you're accessing. For uh, high availability uh, in Alexio, we have uh, both. Uh, we have a couple of options. We could either, for on-premise deployments of Alexio, we have the option of using Zookeeper as a consensus, uh, quorum consen as quorum consensus, or uh, for environments like Kubernetes, uh, we have an embedded quorum uh, consensus algorithm between the Alexio masters, which ensures uh, that Alexio clusters are highly available. So if you uh, so I'm sure uh, this picture reminded you of the HDFS architecture. Alexia masters are similar to uh, Hadoop name nodes and Alexia workers are similar to Hadoop data nodes. Okay, uh, next uh, I'll talk about uh, a, a few Kubernetes concepts which uh, I'll mention in the rest of the talk. Uh, especially of, uh, so these are some components that we use to deploy Alexio on Kubernetes. And uh, for people uh, who need a quick refresher, uh, here we go. So uh, like most of you know, um, Kubernetes is uh, a system for deploying and managing containerized applications. This could include applications like Spark and Presto, and also stateful applications like Luxio. In the next couple of slides, uh, we'll uh, cover some basics, uh, talk about different options for deploying Luxio on Kubernetes, and like I mentioned before, uh, we'll have a demo running Spark on Luxio, accessing data from Amazon S3 in uh, instances in a Kubernetes cluster deployed in Amazon EC2. Okay, so uh, so some of the concepts that Alexia uses uh, from Kubernetes as the container orchestration platform uh, are listed here on this slide. Uh, Kubernetes uh, abstracts away the physical infrastructure, so you can run containers on different physical hosts and uh, this makes the deployment of applications like Alexio repeatable uh, regardless of what your physical host operating system or, um, or infrastructure was. To uh, make it easy for applications to connect to each other on Kubernetes, uh, especially when containers are launched uh, across, on, across different hosts, there is a mechanism called service discovery the other thing that Kubernetes provides and Alexia uses is the self-healing capacity in which, uh, let's say, an Alexia master goes down, uh, Kubernetes provides you with, cons uh, with the ability to relaunch uh, the desired number of uh, pods and containers on the cluster. So secrets uh, is a way of managing credentials. Uh, when uh, Alexio connects to different storage systems such as uh, Amazon S3, sensitive credentials such as the access key and the secret key can be stored in the secret store uh, so that uh, data, any sensitive data is not readily available to anyone. So uh, Kubernetes also has different options for storage management, such as persistent volumes, uh, and the, uh, this is also something that we use to store the Luxio journal in Kubernetes. Okay, uh, 
So uh, the, all these terms should look familiar. Uh, containers are basically a Docker image uh, with a lightweight operating system and the application execu executor environment. Uh, once a container is in a running state, uh, we uh, once an image is in a running state, we can uh, we call it a container. Pods in Kubernetes are the basic schedulable unit. Uh, multiple containers can be combined into the same pod, and this is something that we do for Aluxio as well. Uh, controllers are a way to specify the desired state for pods, and Kubernetes ensures that regardless of the failure scenarios, uh, the desired state of the pods are still maintained on the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, persistent volumes, uh, we already talked about this. Uh, so persistent volumes is used by Alexio as well to store journal or store any state that should be uh, maintained regardless of if a pod is restarted or a pod fails. Okay, so uh, there are different ways of uh, launching or deploying and managing a Kubernetes application. The most basic way of deploying an application is using a declarative YAML file, uh, which specifies uh, the controller, the container image, uh, what uh, containers are combined into a pod, and also the different persistent volumes and resources used by an application like Alexio. So typically what we have is that we have a set of uh, YAML files which we would need to modify to deploy an application like Alexio, and there is a lot of redundancy within these files. For example, the image, the container image, uh, and the tag uh, would be duplicated across a set of these files. What uh, Helm provides is uh, Helm is a thin wrapper over the declarative specifications. Uh, it reduces the complexity uh, by specifying any uh, redundant values in a single configuration file. Uh, this single configuration file kind of compiles into the multiple uh, declarative YAMLs that we used in the previous step uh, so that uh, when you make any configuration change, you have a single location to modify uh, and all, uh, all necessary YAMLs are modified. So another abstraction over the declarative specifications and something that's increasingly used to deploy applications on Kubernetes uh, are Kubernetes operators. Uh, so any domain knowledge uh, that is specific to the application can be built into the Kubernetes and this provides you with the most flexible and easy way of deploying any application on top of Kubernetes. For example, uh, if you uh, are doing upgrades uh, and you want to improve troubleshooting during the upgrade process, uh, this kind of domain knowledge can be built into your operator so that it makes any DevOps kind of uh, operations easy for your admins. Okay, so in, in the next few slides, uh, I'll go into a couple, uh, into some more details of what the solution of Aluxio on Kubernetes looks like. Okay, so um, when you have a Kubernetes cluster which is uh, segregated from the data store, the store, the original source of data. Uh, one way of making the data accessible on your Kubernetes cluster is by copying the data over into the Kubernetes cluster. But what this does is that you need to set up an, uh, set up an ETL job and make multiple copies of the data to make that data accessible on your Kubernetes cluster. Now, uh, in order to migrate the data and for the ETL to work, you need some kind of stateful storage system on Kubernetes. And, uh, and having this kind of storage system on Kubernetes can be very hard. So 
to tolerate elasticity and when you scale your Kubernetes cluster up or down, you might have to both migrate or rebalance your data. For example, if you are scaling your cluster up to have an even distribution of the data, you might want to rebalance your data so that you have uh, your data is still your, you gain you have the performance that you want. But and also, if you scale your cluster down. In order to not lose any data, you would need to migrate data which is present on the larger cluster to the smaller cluster so that any of the data is not lost during the elasticity process. And also, uh, changing applications to any new storage system uh, which uh, is deployed on Kubernetes can be very hard as well. So if your storage system that is available on Kubernetes does not provide a familiar API, your applications will need to change. And also, uh, not just the modifications that are needed to your applications, but uh, tuning your applications for performance can also be equally uh, challenging. So, uh, so this is kind of why we need uh, a solution like Aluxia on Kubernetes. So when you have uh, your compute cluster running with uh, Kubernetes, accessing data which is not present on the Kubernetes cluster, uh, Aluxia brings a few useful features which we have described on this slide over here. Uh, the first thing uh, that Aluxia brings is that Aluxia gets uh, data locality, regardless of if the solution, uh, if your storage is not deployed on Kubernetes. So, uh, in this picture that I have on the right, uh, Spark and Aluxia are running on a Kubernetes cluster, uh, and the data being accessed is in an object store like Amazon S3, or it could be in a different object store such as Google, uh, uh, such as GCS. Now, uh, when you access data from any of these object stores, uh, the first access, what would happen on the first access is that the data would be fetched from your object storage onto the Kubernetes cluster into Aluxia. Aluxia would uh, share this data across different jobs, and your uh, application would schedule on Aluxia with data locality for any subsequent accesses. Okay, so uh, let's talk about another uh, another important use case for Luxio uh, with Kubernetes. So, um, so what we've seen increasingly is that uh, big enterprises who traditionally store their data in HDFS are increasingly wanting to burst into the cloud, uh, burst their compute clusters into the cloud. Like we mentioned before, uh, we've observed that uh, many of the on-premise clusters are typically compute bound, and what they want to do is that they want to access, uh, they want to uh, provision additional compute in the cloud and access their on-premise data. So uh, the two options that we talked about previously was that for a situation like this, what you can do is either you can set up uh, an ETL pipeline, copy all of the data that you need onto the Kubernetes cluster, and then only can you start running your applications. But the solution with Aluxio provides you uh, with a couple of useful things. So the first thing is that the data is accessible immediately. So as soon as you spin up your compute cluster in the cloud with Kubernetes, your data can immediately be accessed from your on-premise cluster without setting up any ETL pipeline. The other thing is that the that data is fetched on access. So even if the storage capacity on your Kubernetes cluster is not high, you would still be able to access data and only cache data in Aluxio which you access. So you don't need to uh, guess uh, or do you don't need to predict what data 
an analyst wants to or will want to use anytime in the future and migrate all of that. So like this is something that uh, fetching data on access is also a, a reason why you would want to use a solution like Alexio. So it, it's called zero copy uh, bursting uh, because uh, you are not making any persistent copies in your, on your Kubernetes cluster uh, and you don't need to set up an ETL pipeline. <coughs> Okay, so uh, getting closer to the demo, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the architecture of Luxio on Kubernetes. Uh, so in this picture, I have uh, two physical hosts uh, running uh, different containers. Uh, the host on the left is running the Luxio master container, and the host on the right is running the Luxio worker container. Like I mentioned, Alexio Master is the daemon which stores the journal and the metadata for the distributed file system. Alexio Service is uh, used by clients to identify and connect to the Alexio Master. So even if the Alexio Master switches from the host on the left to the host on the right, an Alexio client would still be able to connect to the Luxio master using the Luxio service, which provides the a, a DNS host name for any client, regardless of the physical location of the Luxio master container. Uh, to store uh, the persistent metadata, uh, a Luxio can be configured to uh, work with persistent volumes such as Amazon EBS if you're running in Am in Amazon, or you can use any other a persistent store depend uh, st a persistent volume dependent on the cloud that you're working with so uh, when you're running spark on Alexio in kubernetes uh, we have uh, we'll have a spark driver being deployed on some node in the cluster and we'll also have a set of spark executors now, a Spark driver and a Spark executor both uh, have the Luxio client jar embedded in them, and they connect to Luxio masters to identify the location of blocks, and then they'll access the data from the Luxio workers. Now, uh, deploying Luxio on Kubernetes, uh, we have uh, different options. Uh, we can choose to use uh, the declarative YAML specifications, uh, and you can deploy Luxio with the default configuration using a set of commands that I've mentioned on this slide. <coughs> uh, now, uh, recently we've added support for the Luxio Helm chart, uh, which uh, like I mentioned, uh, it's a single location for specifying any redundant configuration, um, and it makes it much easier to install Luxio on your Kubernetes cluster. Now, uh, in the slide, I've, the repository for Helm that we're using is a Luxio repo, which is uh, uh, which is which should be available to your Kubernetes cluster for accessing for installing Luxio using Helm. And this will be in the stable Helm repository starting Alexio 2.1, which is scheduled for uh, later this month. <clears throat> Some of the ongoing work that we have uh, related to Kubernetes at Alexio is including support for uh, large production deployments by by improving the high availability solution that we use in the absence of Zookeeper. Like I mentioned before, Alexio uh, masters have an embedded quorum consensus alg algorithm which can be used for HA in the absence of Zookeeper. Now the other thing that, uh, the other major thing uh, that we have validated recently is the off-heap metadata layer which allows Alexio deployments in Kubernetes to store metadata for 
your files which could be in the billions so you could have you could have uh, you could have files in HDFS and S3, and for Luxio to be able to handle data across multiple storage systems, the metadata layer in Luxio actually needs to be much more scalable than the metadata layer for the storage systems that it's accessing. And this is something that we have uh, uh, that we have uh, included recently. Now, Helm charts, like I already mentioned, uh, this is a more convenient way of deploying Alexio, and now the Helm chart has parity with Alexio deployments in a non-containerized environment. Now, we also have a CSI driver for Alexio coming soon, uh, which uh, makes it easy to access Alexio using the POSIX API. So applications like TensorFlow or any other machine learning applications can uh, simply uh, mount a persistent volume of type Alexio and start using Alexio without uh, the need to distribute the Alexio client jar into the applications that is uh, accessing Alexio. Okay, so uh, I have... Uh, Uh, I have prepared a demo uh, for uh, running Alexio and Spark in, to in Kubernetes, and I'll jump into that very soon. Okay, so like I mentioned before, the, the setup for the demo is uh, a four-node uh, Kubernetes cluster de deployed on Amazon EC2. Uh, let's just make sure nothing is running on the cluster as of now. Okay, so uh, the way that we'll use to deploy a Luxio on Kubernetes right now is using the the YAMLs, uh, the declarative YAML specifications. The first thing that we need to do is uh, deploy the Luxio configuration, which is uh, Luxio config map. So if you look at the config map. Uh, it's uh, a set of configurations uh, that we have uh, for the Luxio cluster. So it specifies the the storage system, which is an Amazon S3 bucket, and it also specifies uh, different uh, different parameters which are needed for Luxio to to run in Amazon EC2. So once uh, the Config, config map is deployed. Uh, the next thing that we do is we create the journal volume. So the journal volume is, uh, let me just delete that first. So the journal volume is used by the Luxio masters to store any persistent state, such as the me metadata for the file system cluster, regardless of uh, if the Luxio master pod start restarts or not. Now, once the configuration and the volume has been deployed, uh, what we do next is that we create the Luxio master if you look at the state of the deployment, uh, we see that we have an Alexio master pod running, and it has two containers running inside. Now, once the Luxio masters are up, uh, we can also look, uh, launch the Luxio workers. Uh, the, in this case, we use uh, daemon sets for the Luxio workers. Uh, we Daemon, a daemon set would mean that a Luxio worker is launched on every single node in the cluster. Now, once the Luxio master and workers are running, we exec into the Luxio master container. <coughs> 
And now we can access the Luxio cluster using the CLI. So if I type in a Luxio FS, uh, we can see the content, contents of the Luxio cluster. So uh, default test files is something that was present in the S3 bucket, which was, uh, which was mounted at the root of the Luxio file system namespace. So in addition to that, what we'll do is that uh, in the demo, we'll be accessing a two gigabyte file, uh, which is in the bucket that I just mounted at location S3A. So what this means is that in if you look at the Luxio file system tree and at the location S3A, we'll have uh, access to the bucket that I just specified on the highlighted line. So any contents of the S3 bucket other hyphen demo hyphen public are now accessible in the Luxio namespace at the location S3A data. So this location is, as you can see, uh, it's a two gigabyte file. The annotation persisted means that the data is only present in Amazon S3 and not inside Luxio at the moment. And 0% also means that 0% uh, of the data is cached in Luxio at the moment. Okay, so uh, in the tab that I have opened on the right, uh, this is something we'll use to run Spark in Kubernetes. Uh, we have a Docker image for running Spark uh, pre-deployed on this cluster. Uh, the Spark image contains the Aluxio, Aluxio client jar, and this can be used by the Spark driver and executors to interface with Aluxio. Okay, so running Spark on Aluxio is as simple as a, a Spark submit job. So once we run this job, uh, we just specify uh, some configurations needed to access Aluxio. As you can see, uh, we specify that uh, we'll access Aluxio, the Aluxio master, and we'll access the data on the location S3A slash data, which is the two gigabyte file. Uh, actually, let me just make a quick modification. There you go. Uh, to specify the correct service name. Uh, and once the container finishes, uh, we should be able to see the logs to Okay, so uh, it looks like we are a little short on time, and also I'm running into some uh, issues with the uh, with the demo. Uh, but uh, so in in since we have limited time remaining, uh, I would like to wrap up on the remaining presentation, and uh, we uh, I'll just walk you through what would have happened in the demo if that was working. So. Uh, we had uh, Luxio, so what we saw so far was that Luxio was deployed on the cluster. Uh, Luxio, we had a single Luxio master pod and a set of Luxio workers. Uh, the workers uh, store the actual data and the Luxio master stores the metadata. We mounted an S3 bucket, which we attempted to access through uh, Spark. Uh, and uh, the first access through Spark uh, would have uh, cached the data, and any subsequent accesses through Spark would uh, would show you a performance boost because the data is now available locally on your Kubernetes cluster. So, uh, in the interest of time, just let me just wrap up, and we can come back to the demo if we have any time remaining towards the end. Uh, 
Uh, what we uh, in, so in this talk we uh, we gave an overview of uh, what data orchestration is. Uh, Luxio acts as an abstraction layer, accessing data from multiple storage systems such as Amazon S3 or HDFS. Uh, it enabled uh, access to data in the Kubernetes cluster, regardless of the location of the data. We ran through a guide of uh, deploying and managing Alexio in Kubernetes using the declarative YAML specifications. And we also uh, showed you a demo of running Spark on Alexio in Kubernetes. So in, in case you guys have any questions uh, left uh, after the session, uh, feel free to reach us on the community Slack. Uh, the Slack address is aluxio.io slash slack. Uh, feel free to find me. My name is Adit Madan. And I'll open the floor to any questions now. Awesome. Adit, thank you very much for the, the presentation. Uh, the demo was equally good even working, but that's, that's all right. Um, there was just a couple of questions on uh, on the Q&A window. Some of them have been answered already. Of course, Aluxio is an open source software and is, un it is under Apache 2.0 license. Uh, and Farzad asked a question. I hope you can answer. So the question is, it, does Aluxio remove the storage space assigned to a container once the container is not running or removed? So is, is it clean up the, the storage after the container is gone? So uh, one after so if you're talking about the storage space that Aluxio uses to cache the data on so once the Aluxio container is gone, Aluxio would clean up after itself, and any uh, storage would be removed. But we also have the option of running Aluxio with uh, persistent volumes. Uh, so and in case you want to preserve the data, that is also a viable alternative. Okay. I think it's, uh, it's a good answer. Um, just now, another question pop up um, from Vishnu. Um, master and slave architecture looks like similar to Ceph. So the question is about the similarity to, to Ceph. And um, does this architecture have issue in rebuilding master specifically? So how does it compare to Ceph? Is there, is there a, a similarity there? Mm -hmm. So um, the it, the architecture for Aluxio and Ceph are a little different. Uh, the way that the we rebuild the Aluxio master is by depending on persistent volumes. So in the configuration that we have, like any Aluxio, any metadata for the Aluxio cluster is stored in persistent volumes. And once the master goes down and is brought up on a different node, or once a secondary master is started, the state of the Luxio cluster can be rebuilt from the persistent volume. So there are no issues uh, in rebuilding the state of the Luxio cluster. Uh, and uh, this is something that we have uh, uh, worked on extremely hard recently, and it, it uh, definitely does not have any uh, issues that I'm aware of. In case uh, there is any specific issue or specific kind of issue that you have in mind, uh, I would love to uh, hear from you. Uh, please get in touch with me on, on the Slack channel or uh, with a follow-up question. I see. So you're saying that, of course, the, the masters of Luxio are protected by the same mechanism as, uh, are they stateful sets or deployments under Kubernetes? That's what you're trying to say? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Uh, another question is also from Farzad. Um, if the container starts after long hours between downtime and runtime, would the storage data be preserved somewhere? So container can start to restop. So it is, if the container is stopped and then restarted, is the data uh, being preserved? I suppose, well, I think they did. The answer yeah. from the previous question. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, like I mentioned, uh, so for the data itself, uh, there are various ways in which uh, you could uh, 
preserve the data across restarts of the worker pods. Let's say for the Luxio workers, the data is stored, could be stored in uh, volumes of type empty dir, uh, which is lost on, uh, on restart, but Luxio would still be able to access the data from the underlying storage system. So let's say Luxio was acting as a layer and, and an abstraction layer between your computer applications and an HDFS cluster. Even if you restart the Luxio workers and you used volumes of type empty dir, which, are, which is cleared on restart, Luxio would still be able to fetch the data from your HDFS cluster. If uh, that is not an acceptable alternative, uh, what you can do is that Luxio workers can be provisioned with persistent volumes. And uh, regardless of how long your clusters were, uh, were uh, stopped for, uh, persistent volumes can be used to recover the data. So Luxio can store data in different tiers. Uh, memory is just one tier, which is lost on, uh, on restarts, but Luxio can also manage data in SSDs and HDDs and, or any other persistent storage that is available on your Kubernetes cluster. And that will be preserved across restarts of the Luxio processes. That's interesting. Okay, I think this answer is good. I have only one last question for myself. Uh, if it's possible to run a Luxio in a multi-cloud environment, so to say, having the storage in S3, but then provide that storage to a cluster running in Azure or Google Cloud. Yes, so, uh, so uh, that is definitely possible, and the, uh, Alexio brings a, a value of uh, not locking into locking you into a specific cloud provider. So, if you have data available in Amazon S3 and you're running your compute on Kubernetes cluster on uh, Amazon resources today, you can easily just as well migrate your Kubernetes cluster to a Google uh, cluster and still access your data which is present in Amazon S3. Uh, the first access would uh, have higher latency since Aluxio has to fetch data from uh, a cluster which is not on the same resources, but any subsequent accesses uh, would uh, you'll still be able to run Kubernetes on Google cluster, but still access your data from Amazon. Interesting, very interesting. Um, let's see, we have four, three minutes left. If you can take a very last question. Oh, this seems to be answered already. Well then, uh, in that case, uh, I will, Thank you very much, Adit. Uh, as you can see, there's a Data Orchestration Summit in Mountain View in November. You can register in the, we also posted the, the link in the chat. And I would like to thank, uh, thank Luxio and, uh, and Adit for the great presentation. And uh, uh, I hope you had a good time. Thank you for joining us. The webinar and the recording will be shared online later today. We look forward to more Cloud Native content computer foundation webinars and for to everybody have a great day thank you